Well, we've been looking at basic Christianity. I want you to look at Romans chapter 12. And we have, in chapters 12 and 13, we have been seeing what the Apostle Paul has to say about what it means to be a Christian. Just basic things. And last week we looked at uh, basic Christianity, God and government. And I want us to go and look again at what the scriptures has to say. And we might call it God and government too. But we're going to be talking about uh, some very important issues that I don't think we think about much as Christians. So I hope it stirs us up. Let's look at chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. Here we go. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you're doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes, too. I looked that up in every version. I looked at the Greek. Odd translations. And I came to the conclusion that it says, pay your taxes, too. For these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Verse 7, give to everyone what you owe. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. God has appointed governmental power, our passage says. First of all, if you're taking notes, the first thing is to punish evil and encourage good. That's what it says in verse 4. For it, the government, is a minister to God for your good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. You ought to be afraid uh, because it doesn't bear the sword for nothing. In other words, it can carry out sentence uh, for it is a minister of God who is an avenger uh, for those who practice evil. So government should promote the common good. Governing officials should just judge justly and pass swift punishment on offenders. Ecclesiastes 8, 11 says, When a crime is not punished quickly, people feel it is safe to do wrong. Isn't that true? Peter's thoughts on this are parallel to Paul's. Peter, talking about government, says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as one in authority, or to governors as sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Now, I think there is an interesting um, connection between verse 4 here. See verse 4 again. And the verse that's six uh, verses above. Chapter 12, 19. Like 12, 19 says, Never take your own revenge, beloved. Remember that? We spent some time there, right? Never take your own revenge, beloved, for, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it's written... Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, I think one of the purposes of government is to execute wrath on those who commit crimes and to avenge those who do wrong. And so, look at verse 19 again. Never take your own revenge, leave room for the wrath of God. Now go down to verse 4. For it is a minister of God to you for good, but if you do evil, jump on down... It's an avenger who brings wrath. So you see those parallel. There isn't a big space. This is one long letter. So when he's talking about don't take your own revenge, he's he's also saying right down there in context, let the government take care of this. Take this to court. Let the courts take care of this as well. I think two applications are good. I think the first is step out of the way. God is going to take care of the bad guy someday. Amen? 
Make room for the wrath of God. Vengeance is God's. But God also, we're just told right after that, he sets up a government authority who will execute wrath and will avenge those who have been hurt. So that's just, I think, another take on the application of chapter 12, verse 19. Now, government officials, secondly, serve God. It says, the ruler is God's servant for good. I'm just going to say this. Whether they know it or not, they are God's servants. You say, well, they're not doing everything God wants them to do. I didn't say that. The Bible doesn't say when they do everything they should do, they are God's servants. It says, no, God's put them in a place of authority, and they are God's servants. We're to accept and understand that authority. Amen? We're to, I know. I don't like. We're to accept. I'm just reading. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities. Do we obey that? Oh, you are so not sure. <laughs> The answer, this is a yes, okay? Do we? Yes. Okay, kids. <laughs> the government, thirdly, should serve the people and do good for those under their authority. Now I'm going to hear a big amen, aren't I? The government should serve the people and do good for those under their authority. Now, I don't want to be controversial, but can I say something here? Northwest is okay with you? Okay. Um, and just, you know, these people who want to live in this country and enjoy its benefits and its protection, and yet they either avoid or refuse to pay their taxes, should be penalized. They're actively working to recruit people, especially young people, to overthrow the government and establish their own. Have you ever thought these kind of feelings? Yes. Well, these were the news headlines in Great Britain in 1763 <laughs> regarding what was happening in the American colonies. Was it not a violation of Romans 13 when the American colonies declared independence from Great Britain and fought to achieve it? Was it right, let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities? For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Was it right? Some Christians say, no, it was not right. This would include Bible teachers like John MacArthur, who believed that the founding fathers were disobedient to God, and the nation was born in sin. Yet despite that, God has blessed this country. He believes this country... Uh, was uh, founded upon the disobedience of those who were rebelling against Great Britain. Well, in the light of what we've learned already, would it ever be right to overthrow an existing government to obtain freedom from that government? Rather than going against their convictions, a lot of people in the colonies moved back to Great Britain because they looked at Romans 13 and they said, we can't rebel against the crown because the word of God says not to. So they moved back and they would not participate. And many of them would uh, not participate and they would lose possessions. They would pay a price because they would stay loyal to the crown based on Romans 13. I want to share uh, with you some of Wayne Grudem's observations from his excellent book. And, and if you're interested in this at all, you should get a hold of his book. It's Politics According to the Bible, Wayne Grudem. Dr. Grudem writes, and just indulge me in, in uh, sharing a lengthy quotation from him, because I think this question is something we never think about or we don't want to. What about the revolution? Oh, was it, what about Roman 13 and the Revolution? Well, I don't know. Don't talk about it. Dr. Crudem writes, I'm convinced after studying the historical situation and the principles of Scripture that the American Revolution was morally justified in the sight of God. The reason that a number of early Americans thought it was justified to rebel against the British monarchy is that it is morally right 
for a lower government official to protect the citizens in his care from a higher official who is committing crimes against their citizens. Therefore, the leaders who founded the United States and declared its independence thought of themselves as doing something that was morally right and even necessary, for they were protecting those citizens in their care from the evil attacks of King George III of England, who had repeatedly acted as a, quote, tyrant, unquote. Those citizens needed protection from King George just as much as they would need protection from a thief or a murderer who would attack people from within the country and just as much as they would need protection from a hostile army that would invade it from another country. Grudem continues, The Declaration of Independence, in fact, contains a long statement of grievances against England that made it, quote, necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which connect them with another, end quote. They wrote that they had endured much suffering, seeking other solutions, and we quote now from the Declaration, prudence indeed would dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Then Grudem, but then the Declaration signers essentially said that they could suffer the abuses of the king no longer. We quote again from the Declaration. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment and absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a Candon world. Grudem explains... What follows is a long and detailed list of the intolerable abuses of the King of England. Then the signers concluded that the declaration, with the indication they were not doing this as isolated individuals, but as representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress, assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. Grudem continues, finally, these representatives of the various states declared, quote, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from an allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we, are mutually, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The Founding Fathers believe that a lesser government official should protect the people under their charge from higher government officials if their people were endangered. I wish there was a New Living Translation of the Declaration of Independence. How about you? <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? We're living in a country that has a democratic process for change. We don't have to have a rebellion to overthrow the government. We have a democratic process. We can legally change government. If we're dissatisfied with the way governmental authorities are behaving over the way they rule us, then we can vote them out. That's the democratic process that we have. If you don't vote, don't complain about the government, okay? Don't talk to me about it. Talk to the hand. You know, don't talk to me about it. Do you vote? You know, oh, look, moan and groan and cry. Do you vote? Oh, no, I don't vote. I don't want to get involved in that. Then, in the Greek, it says shut up, okay? That's what it says. <laughs> get involved. We're living in a country that has a democratic process. 
We don't have to live under despotism. We don't have to live under some dictator. We have the opportunity to completely change a government without violence. Very few countries in this world enjoy that kind of privilege. Thank God he has set this kind of authority over us. Amen? It could be very much worse. If you're not involved in the process God has set up in this country to make change, then uh, really you need to sit back and not say much. Think about, I'm going to say this, think about going into politics. I think you ought to start maybe some of you with your school board or your homeowners association. Please go to your homeowners. Please. <laughs> we, need, we need Christian politicians. We need Christian leaders who will help write policy and influence government. I love in Arizona, we have the Center for Arizona Policy. And they, they have been involved in, in politics, in moving forward morally right, family-based laws, supporting the things that are good. I want to encourage you, if you're looking for a career, you want to get involved now, do it in Jesus' name. Go for it. Influence the world. Influence the community. Then fourth, all government is accountable to God. You know, basically, someday the government's going to have to answer to God. And in Daniel uh, 2.21, Daniel says, it is he, God, who changed the times and the epics. He removes kings and he sets up kings. This is God's authority. Ultimately, God raises up one. God puts one down. And so if a government you know, refuses to acknowledge God, you just have to realize that ultimately they will someday have to give an account of their uh, stewardship of the responsibility that they were given. The consistent message of the Bible is obey the laws of the land. On one occasion, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> some Pharisees, on one occasion, some Pharisees came to Jesus and they were going to trap him, you know, into what... Uh, uh, it looks like to obey the government should they disobey and not pay tax to Caesar or should they pay the tax? And they were th hoping to trap Jesus in this whole situation. But Jesus' response was simple. He said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. In other words, we are to give to God what belongs to him and then as responsible citizens, wherever we live, we will render the government what their government deserves. But here is another good question. Are there ever times when there would be an exception to Paul's command? And I think there are, yes. I think there are times when it's right for a believer to disobey civil government. And I say that very carefully. And I want to say it within the context of the scriptures. There are a number of examples in both the Old and New Testaments where these kinds of situations are recorded. There are five prominent ones in the Old Testament. And the first example of civil disobedience in the Bible is found in the book of Exodus. How about looking at Exodus chapter 1 with me? Setting it up, the people of Israel are under a pharaoh who is threatened by their presence in the country. They are very fruitful. Their numbers are growing. And so the Pharaoh thinks there needs to be some kind of population control imposed upon them. And so let's look at Genesis, I mean Exodus chapter 1, look at verse 15. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives... Verse 16, and he said, when you're helping the Hebrew women give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, then you are to put him to death. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives, what? Feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. And so they disobeyed the law. They said, we are not going to do what you ask us to do because it involves murder. And we will not do that. That is not what God would have us do. And we will not commit this immoral act. In fact, 
they went on to lie. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and he said to them, Why have you done this thing and let the boys live? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous. I think that's funny. And they give birth before the, before the midwife can get to them. Now that's a lie. That's a lie. So God was good to the midwives. Okay, they, they just lied, and God doesn't say, Shame on you. Tell Pharaoh the truth. It says, and God was what? Good to the midwives. And the people multiplied and became very mighty. And it came about because the midwives feared God that he established households for them. <clears throat> now I want you to plug your little kids' ears. Plug their ears. Um, one little boy asked if lying was a sin and he said, yes, lying is a sin and a very present help in time of need. Sergi Bergenoy's lie has been categorized as one of the dumbest lies ever told. Sergi raced through the Denver International Airport trying to catch his SkyWest Airlines flight. Unfortunately, he arrived just after the plane had left the gate with his luggage on board. With his pleas to bring back the plane falling on deaf ears, he offered the gate agent a not-so-subtle reason for doing as he said. <clears throat> the lie. There's a bomb in my suitcase. Their craft was checked for explosives. When none were found, he took another trip of sort to the police station. He's now on probation for six months. Dumb lie. Amen? Dumb. Now, there are several examples of times when people lied in the Bible, and there's no mention of condemnation for what they did. I know, thin ice, thin ice, but these are questions we don't talk about. There are these two midwives. Now, people disagree on this, I grant you that, but if they had not done what they did, we wouldn't have Moses, right? We wouldn't have the Exodus. I think of Rahab, those of you who know your Bible stories. Rahab hid the 12 spies that were sent to, to scope out the promised land. Do you remember that story, most of you? Now, when they came looking for the spies, she hid them and she lied. And she says, I haven't seen them. And so they went on. She lied to protect their lives. And the midwives lied to protect the lives of these, uh, these little babies. There's a very interesting article found in the, on the Stand to Reason website. Write that down and check this website out, Stand to Reason. The mission of Stand to Reason is to train Christians to think more clearly about their faith and to make an even-handed, incisive, yet gracious defense for classical Christianity and classical Christian values in the public square. Don't look it up right now. They say their purpose is to equip Christian ambassadors with knowledge, wisdom, and character. Now, Greg Kukul writes an article about this issue of lying. He says, I think lying is wrong, but we have to be clear on what constitutes lying, that is, immoral deception. It seems that not all deceptions are immoral. Did you ever make a fake while playing basketball? Isn't such a faint deception? It is, but I don't think most people consider it immoral, even though it was, in fact, deceptive. He continues, On the one hand, there are blatant deceptions that are clearly sinful. Then there are also, seems to be, categories of deceptions that don't rise to the category of sin. Then you have, in the middle, situations I would call moral dilemmas. Say that. Moral dilemmas. These are more difficult judgment calls. A moral dilemma is when you must choose one of two things, but either thing would be wrong to do when taking it on its own. Do you endanger human life or do you tell a lie? If you choose to tell the truth, and may you do right by telling the truth, but it seems you do wrong by exposing the human being to serious harm, 
If you protect the human being by lying, well, you've saved a life but told a lie. That is a moral or ethical dilemma. There are a couple of different ways Christians have approached this historically. One is to claim that there really is no such thing as an ethical dilemma. Some will say that you should never lie. You should always tell the truth and let God worry about the consequences. Well, what if you see a woman run into an alley to escape someone who's trying to kill her? And they ask you, where is she? What do you do? Do you send them on a wild goose chase to protect the woman's life, or do you lead them to their victim? Some would say you are morally obliged to tell exactly where she's hiding and let God take care of it. But that option can cut in both directions. Why not protect her by lying and let God take care of it by forgiving the lie? Which do you choose? This question is at the heart of all ethical dilemmas. The Bible gives us some guidance on this. It teaches that not all sins are the same. Some are more egregious than others. This is very clear in the scriptures. Jesus said to Pilate, He who delivered me up to you has the greater sin. According to Jesus, some sins are greater than others. He continues, We can only be adept at solving ethical problems if we give some effort to thinking about it and living the ethical life. I think lying is right sometimes. I think Rahab did the right thing when she lied about the spies. I think the Hebrew midwives did the right thing when they lied to Pharaoh to protect the lives of the Hebrew children. I think trespassing is right sometimes. I think violence is right sometimes. I think there are many things that in isolation would be wrong. But when a higher moral good is served, they, are not, only be, they not only become not wrong, they become obligatory. That's hard for some to accept. Rahab was obliged to lie to protect the lives of those spies. Both James and the writer of Hebrews applaud her for her action. They didn't say, shame, shame, but I guess you chose the lesser of two evils. Instead, they acted like she chose the greater of two goods. She did what was right. I think it's very insightful, don't you? Now, the second incident of brave civil disobedience is recorded in the Old Testament uh, book of Esther, and it involves Queen Esther. There was a law that says you cannot approach the king without an invitation. That was the law. But in order to save her people, many of you know the story of, of Esther and, and wicked Haman, and who was trying to kill all the Jews, and Mordecai, the, her faithful uncle, and how Esther risked her life to go before the king, disobeying the law to intercede for her people. In fact, uh, you may remember her brave words. She says, I will go to the king which is not according to the law, and if I perish, what? I perish. And so Esther, with her brave heart, she goes into the presence of the king. Civil disobedience. She did the right thing. The third example of civil disobedience is that of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who refused to eat the king's food. In Daniel chapter 1, these four Hebrew young men had been taken captive and brought to Babylon to be trained in the king's palace, to be uh, learned in the uh, Babylonian university, to learn all the science, everything that Babylon had to offer. But... It, in, it began initially with them being stripped of their Hebrew culture. They tried to do that by giving them new names. Uh, uh, Hananiah, Azariah, and, and um, uh, uh, Michelle, they had their names changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And so the very first thing they said was, okay, we're going to put you on a, no, a new a new." Regime, you're going to start eating our food. And they offered, they said, this is the law. Daniel chapter 1, you can read it. This is the law. You must eat the king's uh, meat and drink the king's wine. And Daniel refused. He said, I can't do this. And so he, he broke the command. He wouldn't obey the command. And the one who was in charge of them said, you've got to do this. And Daniel says, I can't. But God gave him favor in the, in the eyes of this official. And the official said, look, we'll give you 10 days. And if, if you don't look healthy at the end of this time period, then you're going to have to go on, this, on the king's diet. <laughs> but if you look good and you look 
then I'll let you stay on the seat. Daniel didn't want to eat the, drink the king's wine because he'd been offered to idols. The first fruits of that wine had been poured out to idols. And he says, I'm not, we're not drinking that. And the food was unclean food, the pork and the all. And, and they said, we can't do that either. God has commanded us not to do that. And so rather than being disobedient to God, they were disobedient to the law. They obeyed God. And you know, God blessed in this case. And they were stronger and healthier looking than any of the others who had compromised. And so the official said, you know, you just keep on doing what you're doing. And God blessed them. Then you have another, a fourth example of civil disobedience involving Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and that famous story uh, of the, uh, Nebuchadnezzar setting up his image and them refusing to bow to it. Remember that, it's recorded in Daniel chapter 3, and, and there the king uh, gathered all the officials from all around the, the realm, and he said, when the orchestra begins to play, you're all to bow down to my image. The orchestra music started, everybody bowed down except three. Three of those Jews. And so it was pointed out to the king that these Hebrews would not bow the knee. And so they, they had like, maybe you guys don't get what's going on here. You need to bow when the music plays. So the music plays again, they wouldn't bow. So they're right before the king who's enraged. And the king says, I told you that if you didn't bow the knee, I would throw you into this furnace of burning, blazing fire. And so he was about to follow through with his word, but before it happened, they responded to the king by saying, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king, one way or another. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We're not going to obey this law. And of course, you know, if you're going to take a stand like this, you've got to be ready to experience the consequences. And the consequences were what? A burning, fiery furnace. And sure enough, they were thrown in. And you know how one like the Son of Man was in there with them, and they came out of that not even singed. And it was a great testimony to God. But they wouldn't compromise and during the intertestamental time, you read about this uh, in 2 Maccabees, a very interesting book that we would call an apocryphal book. And you, you read about how the Jews refused to bow and, and to the knee to Antiochus Epiphanes as he was coming in and trying to impose uh, Greek uh, influence in, um, in Judah. Uh, he commanded no one keep the Sabbath. No one circumcised their kids. He commanded that uh, no one observe any of the holidays. He wanted all the Jews to become Greeks, basically. And they refused. He desecrated the temple. He put idols in the temple, brought prostitutes in the temple, sacrificed a pig on the holy altar, tried to force the, pigs, the, the, the uh, priests to eat pig. He, he uh, tried to force it down their throats, and when they wouldn't eat it, he, he uh, had them killed. Thousands of Jews were martyred for their refusal to obey Antiochus' laws. They took a stand. They paid a price. There are two records of civil disobedience in the New Testament. The first is kind of interesting. Maybe you've never thought of it that way, but it's in Luke chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 2. It talks about the wise men. And verse 12, uh, Matthew 2, 12, the wise men had gone to Herod and Herod was interested, well, where is this newborn king? You know, they said we followed his star to here. And Herod is as paranoid a king as you'll find. And so we thought, well, I'm going to take care of this kid before he grows up and threatens me. So he lied to them. He said, well, you, you find where he is in, so that I can go and worship him. Uh, you know, uh-huh. So he lies. Well, he says, and you come back to me and tell me where he is. Okay, and they say, okay. But we find out that they don't. They're disobedient to the king's command because they were warned by God not to go back to him, but to go home. So it says they went home another way. Civil disobedience. Never thought of that. Next time I set up my 
nativity, I'm going to think, oh, there you go, these, these three wise men. Of course, there were more than three. I hate to pop that bubble, but while, while we're doing this, might as well say that, too. <laughs> but the classic New Testament example of civil disobedience is found in the book of Acts, where uh, Peter and John refused to stop preaching the gospel. Let's look at that in Acts. Uh, we'll look at Acts chapter 4. Jesus had commanded his disciples to preach the gospel. That was the Lord's command. Now they're being commanded by the Jewish authorities not to preach, as it says in Acts 14, do not preach or teach or speak at all in the name of Jesus. So that was the command. Well, they went ahead, and Peter and John said to them, whether it is right, I'm in Acts chapter 4 now, verse 19, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot speaking, stop speaking what we have seen and heard. The apostles could not obey the dictates of the Jewish council. They went right on preaching the gospel and healing the sick. But later, their disobedience caused them to be arrested for disobeying the command. And they were put in a public jail. Look at Acts chapter 5, verse 19. They were put in jail, but you know, if God doesn't want you in jail... He sent an angel, and an angel of the Lord during the night opened the gates of the prison, and taking them out, he said, you go, you go and stand and speak the, to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. You don't be intimidated. You just go right on doing what God wants you to do. And so as they did that, they were brought again before the, the council, which would be like the Jewish Supreme Court. And, you know, they're, they're questioning them again. And in verse 28, uh, they say, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And behold, you filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Verse 29, But Peter and the apostles answered and said, Would you read with me? We must obey God rather than men. Now, this is true for every single believer. This is our our motto, this is our guide. We must obey God rather than men. When it comes to moral matters, when it comes to matters that involve us and our obedience, we obey God first. There are times, I think there are occasions where believers must be disobedient to civil laws, but let's stop and think about something. There's a difference between laws, I think there are three kinds of laws as I've been thinking about this. There are laws that compel doing the right, right? Good laws. Then there are laws that permit evil. And then, sadly, in some places, there are laws that compel evil. An example of laws permitting evil would be the laws pertaining to abortion and homosexual marriage that permits evil. You see, the law makes allowance for these things, but it doesn't command these things to be done. For instance, abortion is allowed, but citizens are not compelled to have abortions like they are in China. There's a difference, right? A point of application here are laws pertaining to homosexual marriage. Obviously, a believer will not obey laws that command evil and conflict with God's clear word on the matter in any case. Yet a problem is arising for believers because the laws which permit evil are being used to compel Christians to be complicit in the evil. For instance, the law of the land permits homosexual marriage, which is contrary to the teachings of the Bible. It's permitted. Yet when Christians cannot be supportive of what the law permits... Some are being compelled to support the law. So the law which simply permits evil is being used to compel some Christians to support it. For instance, Christian businesses are being sued 
for not wanting to provide their services for gay marriages. So a law that permits something, okay, we can say, all right, it's permitted, but don't compel me to support it with my services. You understand? And so there is something going on now that I think is just an interesting uh, situation that is arising for the church. What the solution is, I'm not exactly sure. One writer comments, though, when a government passes laws that are against God and his word, we are obligated before the Lord to disobey those particular laws not as a political statement, but as a matter of conscience, submitting ourselves to God's higher law. He continues, realize that civil disobedience is a serious and sometimes costly decision. A good number of Christians across the globe are in jail or have become martyrs because being a Christian or even just talking to someone about Jesus in their context, is a crime, a form of civil disobedience. In Holland, during World War II, Corey Ten Boom and her family were involved in civil disobedience, sheltering and protecting Jews instead of turning them over to the Nazi authorities. Corey and her family paid dearly for their obedience to Jesus. Their crime was discovered and they were sent to the infamous Nazi concentration camp where Corey's sister, Betsy, died. Civil disobedience is not an expression of a Christian's displeasure with a government. Let me read that again. Civil disobedience is not an expression of a Christian's displeasure with a government, government but a courageous, often costly step of faith and obedience to God. We've looked at a lot of issues today that normally never come up, haven't we? Things to think about, things to mull over. Some things are absolutes. We obey the government. We obey the authorities in the land unless they compel us to do something that would be against God's law. We've thought about ethical issues, haven't we? Moral issues, moral dilemmas, things we don't often think about, but it's good for us to stretch our minds so we can think about people who will bring these things up. And it's just my prayer that God will make us people of integrity, people of courage, people who believe what they believe, and most of all, not people that go around defiant, smug, but we have a love for the world. We have a love for the lost, and we're just praying, God, give us a peaceful, safe life so that we can get on with business and not be hindered with persecution. May that be our prayer right now. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for the, the country that we live in. We thank you for democratic countries where... Uh, others of us live or we've come from. We thank you for giving to us the absolute uh, freedoms that we have to change government peacefully and lawfully. Lord, I pray that you would guide the, uh, the elections as they come up. We pray, Lord, that you would um, raise up uh, men and women, young people, young women who will be involved in the political process. Oh, we need them desperately in our, in our country, in its system. Lord, we pray for our president. We pray for, that you would give to him wisdom beyond what he has. We pray, Lord, that you would protect our country, that you would stay the hand of judgment. Lord, we, we know that there have been worse times in this nation. There have been times when that the morality of the nation have been worse than they are now. And you in grace, in your mercy, you've sent revivals. And the course of the country changed. And Lord, we're not intimidated to ask that you would do that again. 
Please send revival. Start it with us, we ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We've been looking at basic Christianity. I want you to look at Romans chapter 12. And we have, in chapters 12 and 13, we have been seeing what the Apostle Paul has to say about what it means to be a Christian. Just basic things. And last week we looked at uh, basic Christianity, God and government. And I want us to go and look again at what the scriptures has to say. And we might call it God and government too. But we're going to be talking about uh, some very important issues that I don't think we think about much as Christians. So I hope it stirs us up. Let's look at chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. Here we go. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you're doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes, too. I looked that up in every version. I looked at the Greek. Odd translations. And I came to the conclusion that it says, pay your taxes too. <laughs> For these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Verse 7, give to everyone what you owe. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. God has appointed governmental power, our passage says. First of all, if you're taking notes, the first thing is to punish evil and encourage good. That's what it says in verse 4. For it, the government, is a ministry to God for your good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. You ought to be afraid. Uh, because it doesn't bear the sword for nothing. In other words, it can carry out sentence. Uh, for it is a minister of God who is an avenger uh, for those who practice evil. So government should promote the common good. Governing officials should just judge justly and pass swift punishment on offenders. Ecclesiastes 8, 11 says, When a crime is not punished quickly, people feel it is safe to do wrong. Isn't that true? Peter's thoughts on this are parallel to Paul's. Peter, talking about government, says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as one in authority, or to governors as sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Now, I think there is an interesting um, connection between verse 4 here. See verse 4 again. And... The verse that's six uh, verses above, chapter 12, 19. Look, 12, 19 says, Never take your own revenge, beloved. Remember that? We spent some time there, right? Never take your own revenge, beloved, for, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, I think one of the purposes of government is to execute wrath on those who commit crimes and to avenge those who do wrong. 
And so look at verse 19 again. Never take your own revenge. Leave room for the wrath of God. Now go down to verse 4. For it, for it is a minister of God to you for good, but if you do evil, jump on down. It's an avenger who brings wrath. So you see those parallel. There isn't a big space. This is one long letter. So when he's talking about don't take your own revenge, he's, he is also saying right down there in context, let the government take care of this. Take this to court. Let the courts take care of this as well. I think Two applications are good. I think the first is step out of the way. God is going to take care of the bad guy someday. Amen? Make room for the wrath of God. Vengeance is God's. But God also, we're just told right after that, he sets up a government authority who will execute wrath and will avenge those who have been hurt. So that's just, I think, another take on the application of chapter 12, verse 19. Now, government officials, secondly, serve God. It says, the ruler is God's servant for good. I'm just going to say this. Whether they know it or not, they are God's servants. You say, well, they're not doing everything God wants them to do. I didn't say that. The Bible doesn't say when they do everything they should do, they are God's servants. It says, no, God's put them in a place of authority, and they are God's servants. We're to accept and understand that authority. Amen? We're t I know, so I don't like it. We're to accept, I'm just reading, let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities. Do we obey that? Oh, you are so not sure. <laughs> the answer, this is a yes, okay? Do we? Yeah. Yes. Okay, kids. The government, thirdly, should serve the people and do good for those under their authority. Now I'm going to hear a big amen, aren't I? The government should serve the people and do good for those under their authority. Now, I don't want to be controversial, but can I say something here? <laughs> Northwest is okay with you? Okay. Um, and just, you know, these people who want to live in this country and enjoy its benefits and it's protection, and yet they either avoid or refuse to pay their taxes should be penalized. They're actively working to recruit people, especially young people, to overthrow the government and establish their own. Have you ever thought these kind of feelings? Well, these were the news headlines in Great Britain in 1763 <laughs> regarding what was happening in the American colonies. Was it not a violation of Romans 13 when the American colonies declared independence from Great Britain and fought to achieve it? Was it right, let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God? Was it right? Some Christians say, no, it was not right. This would include Bible teachers like John MacArthur, who believed that the founding fathers were disobedient to God and the nation was born in sin. Yet despite that, God has blessed this country. He believes this country uh, was uh, founded upon the disobedience of those who were rebelling against Great Britain. Well, in the light of what we've learned already, would it ever be right to overthrow an existing government to obtain freedom from that government? Rather than going against their convictions, a lot of people in the colonies moved back to Great Britain because they looked at Romans 13 and they said, we can't rebel against the crown because the word of God says not to. So they moved back and they would not participate. And many of them would uh, not participate and they would lose possessions. They would pay a price because they would stay loyal to the crown based on Romans 13. I want to share uh, with you some of Wayne Grudem's observations from his excellent book. And, and if you're interested in this at all, you should get a hold of his book. It's 
Politics According to the Bible, Wayne Grudem. Dr. Grudem writes, and just indulge me in, in uh, sharing a lengthy quotation from him, because I think this question is something we never think about or we don't want to. What about the revolution? Oh, it was it, what about Roman 13 and the revolution? Well, I don't know. Don't talk about it. Dr. Grudem writes, I'm convinced after studying the historical situation and the principles of Scripture that the American Revolution was morally justified in the sight of God. The reason that a number of early Americans thought it was justified to rebel against the British monarchy is that it is morally right for a lower government official to protect the citizens in his care from a higher official who is committing crimes against their citizens. Therefore, the leaders who founded the United States and declared its independence thought of themselves as doing something that was morally right and even necessary, for they were protecting those citizens in their care from the evil attacks of King George III of England, who had repeatedly acted as a, quote, tyrant, unquote. Those citizens needed protection from King George just as much as they would need protection from a thief or a murderer who would attack people from within the country and just as much as they would need protection from a hostile army that would invade it from another country. Grudem continues, The Declaration of Independence, in fact, contains a long statement of grievances against England that made it, quote, necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which connect them with another, end quote. They wrote that they had endured much suffering, seeking other solutions. And we quote now from the Declaration, prudence indeed would dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Then Grudem, but then the Declaration signers essentially said that they could suffer the abuses of the king no longer. We quote again from the Declaration. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment and absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Grudem explains... What follows is a long and detailed list of the intolerable abuses of the King of England. Then the signers concluded that the declaration, with the indication that they were not doing this as isolated individuals, but as representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress, assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. Grudem continues, finally, these representatives of the various states declared, quote, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from an allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we, are mutually, we 